Okay, so what's the first thing you think of when you hear the word drug? How you answer that might depend on who you are and what you do, whether you're a doctor or whether you're a drummer in a heavy metal band. For some, uh, the word drug means a therapeutic, maybe even a, a life-saving one, such as an antibiotic or a chemotherapy drug or an antimalarial. Uh, for others, the connotation is a drug of abuse. Um, of course, it, it can be either. Uh, a good example is the opiates, which can give badly needed relief for acute pain, but of course, uh, can also be abused. The fact is that the dividing line between therapeutic substances and substances of abuse is getting even blurrier. And a great example of this is the psychedelics, like LSD, which until recently were not really considered to have much in the way of therapeutic value. But new research has shown that for people who suffer from chronic depression, uh, a dose of uh, a psychedelic uh, can give immediate and long-lasting relief. And the good thing is that you only need to be dosed a few times a year uh, rather than having to pop a pill uh, every day. Now, we've all also heard of mar medical marijuana, right? Now, when states started uh, legalizing marijuana for medical purposes, I was just incredulous. I thought that for the most part, these were not particularly sick people who just wanted to buy pot and get high legally. I used to joke, what's next, medical cocaine? Uh, but then, I uh, heard the story of this little girl uh, called Charlotte Figge. Perhaps you've heard the story too, famously told by Dr. Sanjay Gupta. So Charlotte suffered from uh, a form of pediatric epilepsy called Dravet syndrome, which is characterized by the worst types of, of seizures, grand mal seizures. Uh, that do not respond well to anticonvulsant drug therapy. So by the age of five, uh, Charlotte used a wheelchair and couldn't speak. And it got so bad that her parents, when she was in the hospital, actually signed a do not resuscitate order. But about this same time, uh, her parents also heard about some anecdotal evidence about the uh, potential effectiveness of cannabis uh, to treat Drave syndrome. So in desperation, they, they got some cannabis oil, Charlotte was dosed with it, and the outcome can only be described as a medical miracle. Uh, Charlotte went from having 300 seizures a week to only a few a month, uh, and most of those uh, in her sleep. And she went on to live uh, a pretty normal life uh, until the age of 13 when, tragically, she died from the complications of a suspected case of coronavirus. Now, of course, this dramatically changed the Figgies' lives, but it also really impressed me. It dramatically changed my perception of cannabis. And uh, the constituent of cannabis that controlled uh, Charlotte's seizures is called cannabidiol, uh, or CBD. And that is to be strongly differentiated from the other major constituent of cannabis, which is called tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, or THC, uh, which is responsible for the strong cognitive and motor impairment uh, or in other words, in good technical scientific speak, it's the stuff that gets you stoned. Okay, so, so uh, CBD uh, was something that I got very impressed by because I looked into the medical literature and I saw evidence that CBD could do a lot of 
really remarkable things. Uh, there was evidence it could control muscle spasticity. Um, it could control anxiety. Uh, to some extent, also depression, uh, autoimmune disorders, uh, neurocognitive disorders, even cancer. So I thought this really was interesting and uh, exciting, but there were still some things that bothered me. First, uh, CBD is a controlled substance. And that meant if I wanted to work on it in my lab, I would have to get a DEA license, a Drug Enforcement Administration license. Uh, and that would be time consuming, uh, it would be expensive, and it would mean having to install um, all kinds of uh, security measures uh, in my lab. And I wasn't really interested uh, in, in doing that. Um, second, uh, it was just the notoriety of CBD that, that bothered me. Uh, did I really want to associate myself with uh, a cannabis constituent? I, I wasn't sure I was ready to go there. But most importantly is the fact that CBD can be converted into THC. And this is an easy conversion to do, much easier than the notorious pseudoephedrine to methamphetamine uh, conversion that is done in uh, improvised meth labs. And this is something that, that is being done. Um, you can buy CBD. Uh, there are ways of doing it. Uh, uh, arrests have been made. Okay. So while I was thinking about these things, something very, very simple occurred to me. So here is the structure of CBD. And over here is the structure of a molecule called H2CBD. Can you see the difference between them? OK? Uh, if you can't, I'll point you to the lower left where you see two lines here for CBD. That, that, that con is the connotation of a double bond. And over here, there's a single line. That's a single bond. OK, but that small change, that small change um, kills two birds with one stone. First, uh, the conversion of CBD, like I said, the THC is simple. Uh, the conversion of H2CBD, which stands for dihydrocannabidiol, is virtually impossible. It's not even a cannabinoid. It's a pseudo, what we call a pseudocannabinoid. And this means that we would no longer have to get a DEA license to work with it as long as it is not intoxicating, which it isn't. Okay? So, no DEA license, that's, that's great. Uh, no conversion uh, to uh, THC, because uh, remember, CBD is not as innocent a drug uh, as it looks, okay? That, that abuse potential is there. Uh, but another advantage of this is that we could open up the market uh, for uh, a, a drug, uh, which is basically a small molecule drug, like H2CBD, to penetrate in places where CBD simply can't. Now, even though CBD has been approved by the FDA for the treatment of uh, Dravet uh, syndrome and related syndromes, there are some countries in the world where a constituent of marijuana is not going to get past the border. And don't children uh, everywhere uh, in the world uh, die of Dravet syndrome? Okay, so while I was thinking about these things, um, I also realized that my, one of my main interests is, uh, in my career uh, is as an environmental scientist. And um, one thing that, uh, other thing that bothered me about uh, CBD is the fact that you have to cultivate hemp uh, to make it. But H2CBD and the pseudocannabinoids in general are totally synthetic. They're just made in a lab. Now, the cultivation of hemp is land intensive, water intensive, uh, pesticide intensive, uh, energy intensive, uh, and so we could avoid that uh, altogether um, by, uh, by uh, uh, going with uh, the synthetic uh, cannabinoids. So we had all the motivations in place. Now all we had to do was show that H2CBD could behave like CBD. And for that, we recruited cohorts of uh, rats and mice 
Uh, we subjected them to uh, two different uh, types of uh, modeled seizures, uh, chemically induced seizures uh, and mechanically induced seizures. And to make a long story short, uh, we saw virtually no difference uh, between the uh, uh, prevention of seizures, uh, both the severity and the number of seizures uh, between CBD uh, and H2CBD. So we were really excited about this and we decided to publish it. Uh, and we published it in a, a journal called Scientific Reports. This is a Nature Publishing Group journal. Uh, and I had proposed the title, a Synthetic Non-Intoxicating H2CBD Renders the Case for Medical Marijuana Unnecessary. Uh, and the editor liked the paper, but he said, no way you're going to get away with a title like that. Okay, that's too sensationalistic. And he changed it to uh, Synthetic Non-Intoxicating H2CBD for the Mitigation of Seizures, which is, which is fine. Uh, but uh, this didn't stop uh, the press from getting a hold of this, though there were press releases and, and, and it ended up on news sites, news web, uh, websites, uh, there were tweets. Uh, and this, this article went on to have an altmetric score of 300, uh, which uh, altmetric measures online attention. So this places it in the 99th percentile, top 99th percentile uh, of all uh, journal articles uh, that are tracked of uh, the same age uh, for on, online uh, attention. So we were excited about that. One thing I want to add to this, though, is that, of course, we do these animal uh, seizure uh, trials hoping that the results uh, will be relevant to humans. But one thing we know is that the results are relevant to animals, okay? So if you have a pet rat that's having seizures, you should come see me. Okay, I know how to control them. Uh, but jokes aside, uh, you might not know that dogs and cats suffer from seizures uh, at about the same frequency uh, as, as humans do. And it, it's less than 1% of the population, but that's still a lot of dogs and cats. That's still a lot of, of seizures. And most people are not willing uh, to dose their, their, their pets with cannabis oil, all right? But uh, the pseudocannabinoids, uh, could be a safer uh, and a cheaper alternative. So we started this in uh, 2019, and since then a lot has happened. Uh, we've uh, filed patents. Uh, we formed uh, a company called Syncanica. Uh, we published uh, more papers. Uh, but beyond that, we've broadened the number of indications that we are targeting beyond just seizures uh, to include muscle recovery, uh, to include metabolic syndrome, uh, to include cognitive decline, and also chronic uh, inflammatory pain. Okay, so uh, watch the space. So it's uh, my aspiration that the pseudocannabinoids, although uh, originally inspired by a bad actor drug, may nevertheless uh, bring hope to all the other Charlotte Figgies of the world and perhaps some of their pets. Thank you. <laughs>